Well, we'll make a start, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, very warm welcome uh, to you all from uh, from myself, Martin Lush, uh, from a very very cold and chilly United Kingdom. But um, if any of you in the Northern Hemisphere, you know exactly what I mean. Uh, so, very warm welcome to you all. Um, to talk about uh, over the next sort of 50 minutes, because I really want to keep this sort of um, punchy as well as relevant as we go through. So I'd like to, um, you know, keep the pace fairly quick so that your interest remains engaged. And, and certainly for the number of people dialing in, uh, CAPA effectiveness uh, is really a key, uh, key concern for many of you. Um, this is the second of our free webinars. Uh, many of you tuned in for our January session on how to improve reliability. And as you can see here, and more information on our websites for those of you that haven't registered for the remainder of these webinars, all really designed to, to help you uh, make your life uh, a little easier in what is a very, very challenging environment. So you know, if you haven't registered for any of the others, please uh, feel free to do so. But uh, do it quickly because they're, they're, um, they're filling up uh, very quickly indeed. So for those of you who don't know me, um, you'll realize that A, that picture is, is old, uh, very old in fact. Um, but I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry uh, for over 35 years. I guess if I have a speciality, it's in the field of sterile product manufacture. Um, you know, I've been uh, also a qualified person, both investigating as well as approving deviations. So I've suffered the pain. Um, uh, I know exactly how challenging these uh, these are to investigate and how to use them to drive continuous improvement. Uh, and as you can see, I've been in the, uh, the the industry a long time with auditing and education. Um, and certainly, I do not consider myself in any way to be an expert, just uh, simply experienced. One thing I certainly am is passionate about doing the basics well. And certainly, when it comes to deviation in cappers, this is a basic competency that every company needs to do to PhD level if it's really going to survive, let alone prosper in what is a very challenging environment. Now, my promise is to you guys um, simply um, these. Um, you know, repeat incidents uh, always attract regulatory criticism and impatience. You know, if you look at all of the 483s, uh, you always see, um, uh, just seen, Wonder you, you can't dial in, but you can watch. I really don't know why. Um, a couple of other people can't hear any sounds. Uh, I presume everybody else can. Uh, if, if one of you <laughs> can just drop me a line, we, we did confirm earlier that um, you can you can hear me. So it always gets a bit nerve wracking when somebody says they can't. So Andy or uh, or Bob or Brian, if you can just or oh, Claire, you can hear. That's good. Um, so repeat incidents always attract a lot of regulatory criticism, uh, and understandably so. Um, they can create a huge amount of wasted time and effort, uh, delayed product release, increased costs, increased uh, risks, uh, as, as well as all of the fatigue that is associated with, with having to deal with incidents that tend to happen again and, and again and again. So any of you involved in, in investigating these, I'm sure all of those uh, will, will resonate with you. Um, so my promise to you, every one of you, um, is to ensure that you leave with a summary of best in class practices, um, some immediate actions that you can take. Um, also, I want to give you a flavor of what is possible. You know, nothing is easy in this world. And when it comes to driving down repeat incidents, that's certainly the case. So um, I want to give you some hope <laughs> that if you put the effort in, the rewards are certainly there. Um, and also, hopefully, the confidence to stick with it. Um, as well as some next steps. Um, let's start off with what is possible then. And this is a real life case study from a client that we've worked with for a number of years now. Um, when we first started working with, with um, this particular client, a uh, multi-product facility manufacturing a range of sterile and non-sterile products, uh, as you can see, lots of deviations. They had over 1,500 incidents in 2011. Um, 
which was actually a 30% reduction on the year before. Um, interestingly, when you look to the statistics, 78% uh, of those were repeat incidents. 62% um, of those were down to human error. Um, and, and, you know, inevitably, when we look to those human error ones, many of them weren't. And for those of you who, who um, participated in the last webinar, you'll know that we don't believe there is any such thing as human error. Human error is the, is the consequence rather than the cause, the starting point um, of the investigation rather than the conclusion. But nonetheless, their statistics indicated a lot of these were, were down to human error. Um, Interestingly, their starting point was 100% of these incidents were investigated by QA. Um, most of those investigations started at 28 days plus, and many of you will be nodding in agreement with that. Um, the average deviation report was in the region of three to four pages, and the number of open deviations actually resulted in 34% of delayed batches being released. So. As you can probably gauge from those those key points, a pretty um, pretty challenging environment, all created by the, the challenge with investigating deviations to so-called root cause. 2014, when we went back to them, and bear in mind this is still work in progress. I, I, I haven't been back to them since, but these statistics are pretty impressive when you compare to where they started off. Um, where they are, or where they are, or were in 2014, repeat incidents reduced by 67%. Human error incidents reduced by 90%. Now, that was actually partly due to an education program that we ran there that actually got them to understand um, human error, its causes, and preventions. But as you can see, a dramatic reduction in those incidents. 15% um, of incidents are now investigated by QA, not the the 100% uh, as previously indicated. So a lot greater engagement and empowerment um, from, from the operators and from the engineers rather than just allowing QA to do the incidents. Um, and also 2014, what they also introduced was a risk ranking or triaging system uh, because no deviation is ever the same. Uh, they have to be investigated proportionate to risk, and we'll come on to that later. The only way of doing that is to risk rank and is to triage as they come in. Now, whereas before the incident investigations largely started sort of day 28, where they are now, these incidents are, are risk ranked within two hours. Um, so that the investigation could start very, very quickly based upon risk. And, you know, what they're targeting is, is for that risk ranking and triaging process to be done in 30 minutes. Now, if you want any kind of motivation, um, you know, if you sat there thinking, is this worth the effort, then just look at some of these statistics because, their average deviation report is now one page, and, and they do that through a template that we gave them. And I have to say their deviation reports are a whole lot better to read, a whole lot better to understand, and certainly a heck of a lot easier to complete. Delays in batch re re release you know, is, are now less than 5% compared to what they were before. And if you translate all of that into saving on direct costs, and this was actually an, ana an analysis they did. They, their savings are in excess of $2.5 million. Now, whether that be in infantry savings, whether it be in savings in investigation time and resource, because interestingly, they costed uh, that for each incident they, they um, investigated and reported. It was approximately $5,000 worth of time and resource and effort. So if we're serious about driving down repeat incidents, we certainly need to be focused and motivated and to keep going. Um, and really, I put this slide up here to, to give you that carrot, I guess, to say, look, guys, you know, there is a huge amount of benefit if we're serious about this, but this is going to take time. But you know, it's certainly worth the effort. 
on that slide previously, I also said their quality incidence increased. And you're probably sat there thinking, hang on a minute, Martin, how can you possibly increase the number of incidents and call it a success? Well, actually, that is successful because what it shows is a complete different attitude and mindset when it comes to deviations and, and quality incidents because problems are good. You know, problems are a free lesson in what does not work and a key catalyst for continuous improvement because every effective deviation reporting system has to bring problems to the surface, then we can fix them. You know, if they're buried beneath the surface, they remain buried, they're not seen, and, and they can't be fixed. This allows us to focus on preventing recurrence. Um, but importantly, in this particular example, 80% um, of these quality incidents were fairly minor in, 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 in nature. And really what I want to emphasize here is that we all know that every deviation is different. You have those that are more important than others. However, they are all equally important in that they represent um, opportunities for improvement. If you're operating within a controlled environment, most of your incidents are going to be what I will call quality incidents. I don't call them minor, but they are certainly of lower risk than others. So if we're serious about driving down the 80% of uh, or the 20% of deviations, the more serious incidents, then we've got to really focus on the on the, the quality incidents, those of so called lesser importance, although they generally are greater in number. And this is a for those of you with a familiarity with, with the safety triangle, this is exactly what this is. You know, we know that if we're gonna reduce the number of the, or the risk of people dying, uh, the risk of a fatality, we need to drive down the number of major um, safety incidents. And in order to drive down the number of major safety incidents, we need to drive down the number of minor incidents. And the same applies in deviation and, and uh, uh, incidents in the sense that we've got to fix the minors in order to drive down the more, ma uh, more major deviations. And then in doing so, we significantly reduce the risk of a critical incident happening. Now, this triaging process, this risk ranking is, is really key. We're going to come back to it later. Um, but companies do get criticized by regulatory agencies when they implement this sort of triaging or risk ranking process when importantly when those quality incidents are not investigated they're just considered too minor uh, and and that criticism is justified because in order to drive continuous improvement you've got to really focus on the minor incidents to drive, drive down the major incidents to therefore drive down the critical incidents so uh, just some clarity on the reasons why um, um, large numbers of incidents are good news because actually by encouraging people to raise deviations, raise quality incidents, we bring them to the surface, we can then fix them. And that's what we call continuous quality improvement. Um, so what I'm going to go through, um, everyone, is uh, best-in-class practices. At NSF Health Sciences, previously David Begg Associates, for those of you who, who know us with our previous name, we have over a thousand clients around the world. Uh, we've also worked in devices as well as the aviation and microelectronics industries. So this really puts us in a unique position to to observe best practice when it comes to not just deviation and cappers, but also each and every part of the quality management system. And what I'm about to share with you is what I've seen, what my colleagues and I have observed as best in class practices. So I'm going to give you a summary of each. Um, what I would really encourage you to do um, is to compare what I describe with what you currently do and give yourself a score. Um, you know, if what I say and describe is exactly what you do, give yourself a 10. If it's the complete opposite to what you do, give yourself a 1. And this is a good so a mechanism for comparing yourself and also sharing this information with your colleagues afterwards. because. The types of changes that 
I'm going to be talking about, some of which you can do yourself. And that's one of my promises to you, is to give you five things you can do immediately. Some of the cultural things, some of the performance measures that are often associated with deviation systems that frankly are driving the wrong behavior are probably outside your sphere of influence. And this is where you need that engagement and that you, you, you need that support of colleagues. So you know, one of my challenges to you is to really take this message, you know, share my passion about this with your colleagues because collectively you can achieve exactly what that other company had achieved by saving you know, in excess of two and a half million pounds on direct costs, as well as significantly improving product quality for the good of the patient, which is, at the end of the day, what we're all here to do. Um, I want to give you a plan of action because truly, if you don't act, you will be acted upon in this sense because your business will suffer if you don't get this right. Um, and bearing in mind the longer we leave it, the greater the disadvantage commercially you are at because many of your competitors are already doing this. So let's start off with um, um, one, best in class practice number one, um, which is all about company culture. You know, the, 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 this is the difficult uh, element to, to, to identify with and certainly change. But, if you look at all of the companies where they really use deviations to drive continuous improvements, improvements in quality, improvements in safety, improvements in, in, in uh, savings, um, they all have a very openly and genuinely free, a culture free of blame. You know, people are encouraged to record and investigate quality incidents. They're not seen as bad news. They're seen as free lessons in in, in what doesn't work and a catalyst for continuous improvement. You know, in these best in class companies, people are actually praise for taking action. You know, they're rewarded for raising incidents rather than being punished or, or penalized. Um, and they do this without fear. They, they do this with, with very little concern. Now, this is, in my experience of, you know, I've been in the pharma industry for, for 35 years or so. And, you know, we tend to take a pretty negative view to quality incidents, and that is something that must change if we're going to actually reap the benefits and the rewards uh, that, that we described earlier. So company culture, we could talk uh, a, a, lot, a lot more on how to establish this. And, and in, interestingly, everything I, I cover here, everyone, we go into a huge amount of detail on our two-day course that, that covers each of these in, in infinite detail. Uh, but to give you a summary, um, and I really want to focus on each of the best-in-class practices by giving you the summary, allowing you to rank or score yourself out of 10, which hopefully you've done already for number one, but also to give you the 20% of actions that will drive 80% of the improvement. Um, so when it comes to number one, which is a blame-free culture, here are the, the key points, none of which I think will be surprising to you. You know, we all know blame culture stinks. You know, we've all experienced it in our careers. It's not a nice place to be. Uh, you probably think that there are elements of your own company that have this blame culture. Um, but it's poisonous, it's dangerous, uh, because frankly, if you encourage people to hide problems, you can't fix them. You can only fix what... Um, uh, you know what you uh, what you can see. Um, performance measures that you choose have to drive the right behaviour. Um, and frankly, if you have you know one one of the worst performance measures on a deviation in Kappa system is to actually encourage people to drive down incidents. That's not what we want to do, because you will get incidents reduced. But let's not kid ourselves; they're probably still happening. They're just not being investigated or reported thoroughly enough. Um, we really do have to work on people's mindset to say, look, deviations are learning opportunities. And we're going to come back to this later. Um, I've just seen some, some questions coming in. Um, I always have great difficulty multitasking, guys. So I'll try and address the questions as I go through. Keep them coming, guys. Ian, you just sent one in. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of try and address these right at the end rather than sort of flicking between the, the slides and the questions. Um, 
we've got to re reward people for raising deviations. We've got to go and look for incidents before they happen. And the best in class companies actually do that. The, they, they will go out and do um, reviews of, uh, you could almost call them mini self-inspections, where they take a particular area on a daily basis. It could be the, the, the stability store. It could be the incubators in the micro lab. It could be transfer hatches, where the objective is to spot problems before they actually occur. So the focus is on prevention rather than the reaction. And finally, number six, um, to celebrate success, you know, to actually celebrate the fact that people are, in, are, are raising incidents, but importantly, those incidents are not happening again. So company culture is always challenging because typically in the pharma industry, deviations are seen as bad news um, and, and the measures usually drive the wrong behavior. So key attribute number one, key best in class practice number one is all about culture, openness, transparency, blame free, encouraging people to raise incidents, bring them to the surface, fix them. Question for you, what do all of, us, all of the following have in common? You, you know, give you time to, to read through all of these. Um, the answer is they are all, or were all, so-called mistakes, quality incidents, deviations, call them what you will. So the point I'm making here is that some of the greatest inventions of our time, if you consider cornflakes to be a great invention, um, were from mistakes. Um, and actually, it's really quite interesting when you read around some of these to understand you know, how post-its were invented. You know, this is a, a glue scientist. I never realized there was such a thing, but a scientist at 3M charged with the responsibility of, of, of manufacturing, designing, finding, formulating a really, really sticky glue. Well, this particular scientist didn't find a really, really sticky glue. He found a glue that continued to stick no matter what. Uh, so this, in each of these examples, the person involved and engaged with the discovery actually didn't see it as bad news. They continued to explore, dig a bit deeper, and as a result of that exploration, came up with some, some great inventions. I have to say the one I find uh, amusing out of all of these is the fireworks one, apparently. If you look at the research, fireworks were discovered by a, a cook in, um, in China. Um, identity unknown, and I often think whether that was because the, exper the second experiment they did didn't maybe go according to plan. But in each of these incidents, everyone, um, they were all deviations. And the particular people involved didn't have the, oh, damn, you know, this is bad news attitude. They had the second one, which is, look, that's interesting. Let's dig a bit deeper. You know, what can we learn from this? And this is a really important aspect for any pharmaceutical company to understand is that, on the one hand, certainly get your culture right. You know, encourage people to raise deviations. But, you know, they will do that when they see the benefit. And people need to understand that when mistakes happen, there's, a, there's a, an incredible opportunity to open that can of worms, you know, to, to really explore and dig deep because there are great things that can come from mistakes. And so often they're ignored in, in the pharma industry. So... Number two is about the, the best in class practice is, uh, is about taking a positive attitude to errors and mistakes. And, you know, if I was to summarize the 20% the of actions that you need to complete to engage with, with, with this particular requirement, here, here are my one to six. Um, Firstly, when an incident happens, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's no point worrying about it. It's happened. You can't reverse that. So move on. Don't waste time and energy on the why, which is often the case, you know, the finger pointing, the who, you know, how did it happen, but actually focus on what can be learned, uh, the contributing factors. And we're going to come back to what we mean by contributing factors in a minute. Um, You've got to focus on the 
process that led to that error and mistake, not the person who actually was engaged with it. And so often in investigations, you know, it's the guy on the shop floor, the operator, the analyst who was involved with that mistake, who often feels the heat of the investigation, the focus of the investigation being directed to them rather than the contributing factors that actually led up to it. You know, th th so many people say to me, yes, Mark, Martin, yeah, it's great if, you, if we had nothing else to do. Um, are you seriously saying we need to be spending days on investigations to dig deep and deep and deep? I don't have time to do that. Well, they always seem to have time to do it again and again and again. And this is something that we need to be consciously aware of for every repeat incident that is a consequence of not enough time being spent on the investigation, that is money. Um, $5,000 for each incident. Um, according to one of our clients. Not only is it very expensive, it's very, very risky because, you know, there's increased risk every time a repeat incident happens. So, you know, can, do you have time to investigate everything in the way that I described? Absolutely not. But if you triage and you risk rank in the way that we described earlier, this is when you start to focus on what's really important. And we're going to talk more about that later. Please, please make sure that, that measures drive the right attitude and the right behavior. Um, we're going to talk more about measures later. There's only two measures that are really worth using um, when it comes to deviations, and we'll examine those later on. And finally, remember there is no such thing as a single root cause. You know, I often get sort of frustrated when people talk about root cause. It's understandable because the regulators talk about root cause. But in any incident, there is no such thing as one single thing that actually caused that incident. There are always multiple contributing factors. And you know, SOP non-compliance is a classic example. All of these factors, whether it be over-complexity, too many words, culture of non-compliance, the list goes on and on and on and on. If we're serious about preventing SOP non-compliances, we've got to tackle the errors beneath the surface, what we call the contributing factors, rather than blaming the person who is not following the SOP, and it's often then put down to human error, when in fact it's a result of multiple contributing factors that have, that have uh, led to that. So part of the, the, the mentality we need to adopt in investigating incidents is to say, look, there's no such thing as a single cause. We've got to dig beneath the surface. And this is the basis of Toyota's five whys, because at least you get five contributing factors um, rather than just the one. So, the sort of um, what, what one thing I will say to you, and there's a there's a very big soap box in the corner of my room, and and I'm going to stand on this soap box now and preach a little because there's one thing that really kills me. It's this 30 day rule. I've never understood it. Uh, it's it's it communicates we don't care about incidents because if you did care about them, you would fix them sooner rather than later. Um, it communicates these aren't really important. It actually encourages poor investigations because the longer we leave the investigation from the incident happening, the poorer that investigation. You know, frankly, anything longer than 24 hours, you may as well not bother because you're relying on people's memory, and we all know how poor that is. And then the investigation and its conclusions are based upon fiction rather than fact. Um, the 30-day rule is convenient, but it's ridic it is plainly ridiculous. It's just plainly wrong. So I'm going to get off my soapbox now uh, because, um, you know, um, if we're serious about incidents, we fix them quickly, not within 30 days. And interestingly, people say, oh, yeah, Martin, it's a regulatory requirement. It's not. It never has been. It's been misinterpreted. Uh, because I certainly haven't met, met any one investigator who is happy with a 30-day rule for investigation of, of incidents. Um, number three, so number one key best industry practice is get the culture right. Um, number two was the positive attitude 
to deviation incidence. And that is linked very closely to understanding the anatomy of the incident, which is contributing factors rather than a single root cause. And then number four, number three is um, all of the systems that work really, really well have been designed with the active participation of all users. So good user-centered design, because the system is used by so many people, whether it be in manufacturing and engineering, in, 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 in clinical teams, the list goes on and on and on. And it's really important that they have a system that is user-friendly, easy to complete. It standardizes what they have to do in a very simple way so that it's just kept simple. And, and the users of any system, whether it be change control, whether it be deviation or kappa, all they want is a simple life. So number three, best-in-class practice is that in all of the companies that have great systems that deliver the results that we were talking about earlier, um, they all have systems that were designed with the active participation of the users, and they are all really, really simple. Um, and the investigation and reporting formality is proportionate to risk. That is really, really key because inevitably there are some deviations that are more risky to the patient and to the business than others, and that by definition means that they are, they are subject to a more thorough, more detailed investigation and a thorough and more detailed report. Um, so when it comes to user-centered design, you know, the 80-20 the rule, you know, what are the 20% of actions that will give you 80% of benefit? Well, here's my first stab at those. Firstly, the format that you use for reporting must trigger the right investigation and risk assessment habits. And I'm going to give you an example of that on the next slide. It's got to be simple. It's got to be fast. It's got to be effective. And you've got to allow people to tell the story of the incident because certainly for regulators, for auditors who assess your professionalism as well as your understanding of the process, one great mechanism of doing that is to look at the way you report incidents because the way they're reported has to be indicative or illustrative of the, the way in which the investigation was was, was initiated and completed. Now, this is a, a template that we use on our course. We, we get people to practice using this. I put it up there as an example because this actually is a deviation report. So at the top of the page, you know, you have the administrative stuff as to who is the lead, who's in the team, does it need to be escalated, what is the situation statement, in other words, what are the contributing factors, um, and there's different tools and techniques down the left-hand side that we, we, we don't have time to go into now, um, but we do, we, we, we do on the course. But you can see there's use of the Ishikawa diagram where contributing factors are grouped or clustered around certain, you know, is it procedure, is it people, is it plant? Um, you can see there's a risk assessment box. You can see next to that the control measures that are put in place. Uh, you can see the discussion and final decision at the end. And finally, down the right-hand side, um, you can see the decision-making process and some of the tools and techniques that can be used. So this is something that we go into a lot of detail on our course so that people are familiar with how to use this. But people who use this um, tell us some really important things. Number one, it drives the right behavior because it gives people almost a step-by-step um, guide as to what they have to do and when they have to do it. And the regulators that have used this reporting format like it as well because it shows the thoroughness of the investigation. It shows that it's been properly done. It shows that the conclusions are being properly considered and the risk assessments actually done. And it allows somebody who is being asked to describe that incident, often many years after it's happened, they have the raw data there to to actually uh, to actually achieve that um, so really really useful we we get people to practice this uh, on the course but as you can well imagine a lot easier to complete it directs people down the right avenue it enforces the right disciplines and practices and as such it's a, it's a really great template to actually use
But as again, as, as we said earlier, it has to be customized. This is something that we've developed with some of our clients. It may not be perfect for your use. The point I'm making is reporting is key. The report is not just a paper written on the incident. It has to create the incident historically. It has to contain all of the data and all of the information, and this template does just that. And it avoids this, uh, you know, We've all been involved in writing deviation reports, uh, particularly with difficult investigations, and spending hours and hours and hours deciding on what language to use, what tense to use, does that sentence structure look and sound right, and so on and so forth. That takes away all of that and just gives you what you really need, the facts, the risk assessments, and the conclusions. So simple, fast, effective, and, and drives the right behavior. So we talked about culture, we talked about positive mindset, we talked about the, the anatomy of the problems and contributing factors, and we talked about the importance of, of the reporting process. Number four, um, key industry practice is, is, is pretty, pretty self-evident, um, and you would say common sense, but actually common sense isn't always practiced. Um, in all of the companies that really drive continuous improvement through the deviation and CAPA system, what you will find is number four, which is the knowledge of, and skills of the people are second to none. They have in-depth, the emphasis is on in-depth expertise in, in, in their products and in their processes and in their procedures and in their practices. They have experts, they, but the general level of knowledge and understanding is very, very high. Um, they have very good problem solving and risk assessment and decision making skills. Um, and on the course that we run, we talk about what they are. We talk about how you create those habits so that they are done automatically. Um, so that no matter what pressure people are under, they will follow the same investigation process because what I find quite interesting is the you know a lot of companies put a lot of investment into problem solving tools and techniques and yet their level of repeat incidents remain very very high and you're left wondering why is it those methods those tools and techniques are not being applied correctly and there's some truth in that or is it because they're actually not asking the right questions because they don't have the knowledge of the manufacturing process, uh, the products, and they're not risk aware. In other words, they don't really understand the consequences of thing going, things going wrong. And often it is, it is that, you know, that, that lack of knowledge of the product and process that then prevents them from doing an effective investigation. And certainly at NSF, we've been asked to do a lot of deviation in CAPA and problem solving courses. And you know, after the first morning, we actually go back to the client and say, you know what, you don't need a session on problem solving. You need a session on your manufacturing processes, the, the characteristics of the drug, um, what, it, what impacts uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, what are the critical control points? Because without that knowledge, you cannot do ever an effective investigation. Um, so that's number four, ladies and gentlemen. And the sort of 20% of actions that will help you achieve 80% of the benefit from number four. Here are my, my top five for you to take away. In-depth knowledge of the product, how it works, the what-ifs, when things go wrong, the process CCPs, as well as you know, the problem-solving skills, both soft and hard. Um, I, I make a distinction there, guys, because you know, I see so many problem-solving courses being run that are totally ineffective because they are too mechanical. You know, they are too focused on the hard tools and techniques. Good problem solving is 80% soft skills, 20% hard skills. In other words, the ability to ask questions of the right person in the right way, active listening skills. Um, peeling the onion, which is a technique we call about, or we, we, we cover on the course. You know, the ability to put people at ease, the ability to help people recreate the incidents that happened, that takes a, 
a lot of skill in communication, in negotiation, and in putting people at ease. And so often, that's not covered. So good problem solvers are those that have that range of skills, 80% soft, interpersonal, questioning, active listening, communication type skills, combined with techniques that many of you will be familiar with, whether it be force field analysis, um, and a lot of the lean tools that, that many of you are familiar with. Um, my second one there is really, really key. The ability to conduct mature and intelligent risk assessments. That can only be achieved when you have number one. Um, number three, process owners, in my experience, are always the best problem solvers, you know, the operators, the engineers. And without any disrespect to QA, often they are the worst problem solvers because they don't have that current and up-to-date knowledge of the manufacturing process. So better engagement to the process owners is really, really key. Give them the tools and techniques. Balance that alongside their knowledge, their expert knowledge of the manufacturing process, and you've got a very, very powerful combination. Number four, never do what I certainly was guilty of doing as a young QA officer in my previous career, never do investigations from behind a desk, ever, never, ever. We've all done them, and they're all, they've all been wrong. The only way you can do an investigation is to go to the scene, do the gemba, or as, as we say in North Yorkshire, goya, uh, which means get off your ass. Get off your ass, get down onto the production floor, go into the lab, go to where the incident happened, because then you can start to engage with the people. You can start to identify the environment within which the incident happened. You've got to do it quickly. You've got to do it immediately. But you're only going to ever do that and invest that time if you've got an open, blame-free culture, number one. Number two, you take that positive attitude and see the investment that you, you gain from doing these thoroughly uh, and, and, and in a comprehensive way. And remember, you know, remove from your vocabulary that term root cause. It's wrong, doesn't exist, and when you start talking about root cause, you actually drive the wrong behavior because you are actively encouraging people to just look for one thing. As we all know, it's, it's not just one thing. It's, an, it's a number of things. Uh, the error chain. And the job of the investigator is to drive the, uh, the drive as far down the error chain as you can. Um, number five I've alluded to, um, immediate reporting. Um, incidents and events have to be reported without delay um, because the, the, the longer the delay, the more inaccurate the information becomes. The quicker it is reported, the more accurate, the more relevant, um, and therefore the better the investigation as a result of good data. Um, so the best-in-class companies report without delay. Now, there was one company I was at recently where they did that triaging process within a couple of hours. Every day, the plant quality assurance officer would meet with the production officer, uh, the production manager, they would review the incidents, they would risk rank every two hours. Um, corrections are implemented immediately without delay. CAPAs are identify, uh, identified and assigned based on risk. And implementation is quick, not just the 30 days, uh, but I'm not going to get back on my soapbox uh, on that one. Um, but the key thing here is, look, these are important, guys. Um, we need to get to the incident quickly at the shop floor where it actually happened. We need to report quickly. If we don't, all of the effort that goes into the investigation from there on is actually, in my opinion, wasted effort because you're not driving the investigation with the most appropriate and the most accurate data because people have forgotten. So, um, um, it, it leads us into number six, everyone, um, the triaging process, because um, in order to risk rank or triage, we need very clear objective criteria because they need to be triaged or prioritized based upon risk, not just gut feel, but quantifiable data. 
um, because no two incidents are the same. And if you do treat every incident the same, that actually is a dangerous deviation system because um, when it, every incident is treated the same, uh, the really important ones get missed. Uh, and investigations have to be uh, proportionate to risk. And when we're on the course, we actually show um, a, a method of doing this, uh, a customized impact assessment form. Um, very quick, very simple, very easy to use, but it drives an objective assessment as to how important is this, um, rather than it being gut feel, because gut feel is often wrong. It's a quick quiz for you. Uh, so grab a piece of paper. Um, and risk rank these, one to seven, okay? Uh, talk failure, screw caps, uh, harder to open, pinholes in a blister pack, uh, a microbiological out of specification to do with purified water used in granulation. Number four, you found a foreign or rogue tablet on a packing line. Number five, a uh, sanitizing agent that you've been using has expired by two weeks. Number six, an environmental monitoring failure for an active air sampler um, and what you found in that sample are lots of molds and lots of bacillus in an uncontrolled area. And number seven, poor clothing practice. So very, very quickly, give a sort of mental um, risk ranking process to that and see what you come up with. What would be your top three? What would be your, your bottom three? Well, um, here you go. Uh, and this is where there's always time for disagreement uh, because you're saying, well, Martin, you know, we need more information and, and, and that's that, you know, what you've given us isn't enough. Well, here's my assessment of risk. You know, the torque failure where that lid is too tight is critical if it's a product like glycerol trinitrate um, used in, um, in cardiac conditions uh, where the patient needs immediate relief from their angina attack. Now, that's not going to be as critical if it's a paracetamol or um, simple pain relief. Um, let's take another one. You know, the micro failure, frankly, is not worth worrying about. It's a staphylococcus species to do with granulation. That organism uh, is going to be uh, killed off uh, in the manufacturing process. The, it's a non-sterile product as well, and so on and so on and so on. So what I'm trying to illustrate with this exercise uh, is that before you risk rank or triage, in other words, decide where your focus and resource goes, you've got to fully understand the data first. You've got to take a structured approach. You've got to conduct an objective impact assessment. You've got to think about the big picture. Um, you've got to realize that not every incident is the same. And, and I put the last one up there. You know, thank goodness I'm in charge of the mute function because I imagine there's a lot of discussion in the rooms going you know, in, 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 in disagreement with my conclusions <laughs> regarding what is high, medium, and low risk. The point I'm making is to be effective, You've got to triage. You've got to do that very, very quickly so that you can go to the scene very, very quickly based upon where those risks um, exist. How do you do that? By using an objective risk ranking process, using objective impact assessments that we cover on the course, and that allows you to really triage effectively uh, and, in, and in a very, very disciplined way. Number seven, just so coming to the last 10 minutes, guys. Number seven, um, best-in-class companies always take a very structured approach to every incident um, they investigate. It's always systematic. Um, it's always data-driven. Um, there's always consultation with others when appropriate. It's always done at the scene. Remember Goya. And the investigation process is always transparent throughout. Now, on the template that I gave you earlier, there was actually a decision-making process outlined down the right-hand side of that template. And that's certainly what we, we get our delegates to practice because it's not a natural thing for many people to do. And it takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of practice. But structured problem-solving and decision-making processes drive standardization 
and they improve the consistency of the investigation so that you know that those contributing factors down at the bottom of that error chain are being addressed because it's only by addressing, fixing the contributing factors are you going to stop the repeat incidents actually happening. Um, moving on to number eight, um, best in class companies, everyone, have corrective and preventive actions that are value adding. Um, you know, they address the multiple contributing factors. The actions are agreed in advance before they are assigned. Um, complex resource hungry cappers are assigned a sponsor to enable the implementation of those. And there's no what I call window dressing cappers. You know, in other words, the ones that sound good but you and I know have no benefit. Classically, they would be rewrite the SOP or let's do some more retraining. Let's add a couple of check signatures. All of that gives the um, impression of progress but actually contributes further down the line to more problems. And when we talk about cappers, let's be clear on what we actually need, mean by cappers. And this is directly from Q, you know, what, what I've described here is directly from ICHQ10. You know, if you were to walk out the factory, guys, and you trip over the pavement or the sidewalk, and you graze or cut your hand, the correction is the application of a plaster or a band-aid. In other words, the correction to your deviation is when you, are, are the actions you take to deal with the immediate risk, okay? The corrective actions are those that you do to prevent recurrence or return of that incident. So in the example of tripping over the pavement or sidewalk, you know, you'd possibly tape off the area. You would hit, hammer down if you could, stamp down the trip hazard. You would put up a sign saying, beware trip hazard. So you've prevented somebody doing the same thing locally. And then preventive is actually preventing the probability of occurrence of that happening again elsewhere. Um, so that's when you'd get on to your local council to start talking to them about design and materials of construction, the contractor selection, so that you extend prevention further than the actual uh, factory itself. Um, because really, you know, if we want to stay in business in what is a very, very volatile environment, we've got to move from CAPA, our traditionally reactionary approach, to PACA, um, doesn't trip off the tongue as easily, but focusing on preventing um, by changing attitudes, changing systems, by changing measures, by changing rewards. And this is the key step that we in the industry have to take is forget reactionary CAPA and move to preventative PACA. Um, and finally, you know, deviation report, really quite simple, guys. It's just got to tell the story. It's got to make sense years later. And if you stick with the template that we covered earlier, that goes a long, long way to, uh, to actually doing that. And please, please, please make sure your measures drive the right behavior. And I said, look, there are only a few measures that are worth talking about when it comes to incidents. Um, performance measures have got to drive the right behavior. And here are those examples. If you measure the number of repeat incidents, not the total number, that drives the right behavior. Because what you're saying to people is, look, let's do the investigation well, guys. Let our focus is on preventing it happening again. The number of if quality events versus the number of deviations is a good one, because that ratio changes if the system is working. Because you expect deviations to come down, because you're doing really good investigations of the minor incidents or what we call quality incidents or events, but you're encouraging people to raise those because you want to know what the underlying trends are. And, and also knowing, you know, your right first time statistics um, is key. And one other measure I would really encourage you to do to implement is measuring the time between the incident actually happening and the investigation starting. The shorter the time, the better the investigation, and it drives the right behavior. So um, just taking a breath there, guys, because my promise to you earlier was to give you five things that you can do immediately. Now, for each of those best-in-class practices, I've given you the 20%, in my opinion at least, the 20% of 
things to focus on to get 80% of benefit. But I'll leave you with these one to find five. Number one, the tough one, change your attitude towards incidents first and then sell your successes. Prove to people that taking a more proactive, positive attitude to mistakes is good. Think error chain, multiple causes, not root cause. And the, you know, if you want to adopt a really simple technique, just, just use five whys. It takes practice. You can only do it with really good understanding of the manufacturing process, but think error chain, not single root cause. People often say to me, Martin, where do we start? You know, we've got 2,500 deviations. Where the heck do we start? Well, what I say to people is, look, just do some simple trending. Look at the 20% of common causes that are resulting in 80% of your deviations. And, and we've worked with companies and reduced their incidence by 60 to 70% in two to three days by applying this, 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 this process, where you trend, you look for the patterns, you focus on maybe uh, it's environmental control that is leading to so many incidents in a particular area, where you treat that as a project. You know, you take the subject matter experts away from their work, you stick them in a room, um, you give them the tools and techniques, and they can fix all of those incidents by tackling them as one. This customized impact assessment form uh, is really, really key uh, and, uh, because the triaging process is really, really fundamental. And, and just remember, finally, guys, that the, the healthy CAPA, that should say um, ratio, not ration, is for every one correction, there should be two corrective and there should be three preventive. Now, I could argue a bit over those ratios, but you can see what I'm trying to get at there. The focus has to be on, on prevention rather than the reaction. So just to bring things to a close, I just want to, if I can, after these last few slides, just pick up on a few questions that people have raised. Um, I'll send you some key references. Um, please, please, now we, we do this, we do mean this sincerely. Um, there is free advice. If you want more, inform more information, there's lots of questions that have come through that, you know, how do I change culture? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a challenging one, but I can certainly give you guidance on that. Um, uh, there's a lot of, you know, Joanna, you've, you've asked a lot of really good questions around, you know, what does correction imply and so on and so forth. We're not going to have the chance to answer those, but, but please get back to me. And, uh, and for any one of you, where you want clarity or more detail, please just drop me an email and I'll send you it through, through to you. Um, we'll send you a free course outline. We have courses um, both in Manchester and in Amsterdam. They're, they're, they're the dates. If you really want to get into this in more detail and make a difference, please um, drop me a line about those courses. They're great courses and you'll learn um, in a lot more detail about each one of these uh, areas. Uh, this is really just a, to give you a flavor as well as giving you some practical tools and techniques. And um, please, please, will you spread the word? Will you share our passion? Because I really do, right at the beginning of this session, I said, look, if you want to be around in the next five to eight years as a company, this is one thing you've got to do exceptionally well, and you have got to start now. So. The sooner you help engage others in that passion and in that commitment, the greater your chance of success because the return on the investment, as you've already seen, is going to be guaranteed. What I've left you there with, guys, is a ladder. Uh, it covers each of those best-in-class practices. I recommend, please, you take this. Um, ask your colleagues to score. See how far you are up the ladder because you're, if you're not at 9 or 10, you will not be in business in the next uh, few years. Um, please spread the word. Um, this webinar is being recorded. You can download it. You can download the slides. So please do that. Please spread the word uh, because the more people that know about this, the better. Um, so there was my promise to you. There was the challenge with regard to what incidents, um, repeat incidents do to us. And that's all negative, painful, and unsustainable. And what I hope you've left with um, is a summary of those best-in-class practices. I hope you feel as if you've got some immediate things that you can do. Um, I hope you've got a flavor of what is possible and you really feel engaged with you know, fixing this and the confidence to stick with it. So 
on that note, dead on two o'clock, thank you ever so much for your attention. And please, can I ask you to, to feed back on the webinar? We take your feedback really, really in, uh, um, importantly. Um, so any feedback as to how we can do, how we can improve, um, please do so. And I look forward to um, engaging with you again on the next webinar where it's, we're going to get into more of the psychology of what people do in the workplace and how we can improve quality habits in the workplace so that people are doing what they have to do in the right way no matter what the pressure. So look forward to speaking with you soon. And please, if you need any more information, you've got my email address and you've got my contact details. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.